The Sound of Summer Running from Dandelion Wine by Ray Bradbury Late that night, going home from the show with his mother and father and his brother Tom, Douglas saw the tennis shoes in the bright store window. He glanced quickly away, but his ankles were seized, his feet suspended, then rushed. The earth spun. The shop awnings slammed their canvas wings overhead with the thrust of his body running. His mother and father and brother walked quietly on both sides of him. Doug Douglas walked backward, watching the tennis shoes in the midnight window left behind. It was a nice movie, said mother. Douglas murmured. It was. It was June and long past time for buying the special shoes that were quiet as a summer rain falling on the walks. June and the earth full of raw power and everything in ev everything everywhere in motion. The grass was still pouring in from the country, surrounding the sidewalks, stranding the houses. Any moment the town would capsize, go down, and leave not a stir in the clover and weeds. And here Douglas stood, trapped on the dead cement and the red brick street, hardly able to move. Dad, he blurted it out, back there in that window, those cream sponge pair of light foot, foot shoes. His father, father didn't even turn. Suppose you tell me why you need a new pair of shoes. Can you do that? Well, it was because they felt the way it felt every summer when you take off your shoes for the first time and run in the grass. They felt like it feels sticking your feet out of the hot covers in the wintertime to let the cold in from the open window blow on them suddenly and you let them stay out for a long time until you put them back under the covers again to feel them like packed snow. The tennis shoes felt like it always feels the first time every year wading in the shallow slow waters of the creek and seeing your feet below half an inch further downstream with reflect refraction than the real part of you above water. Dad, said Douglas, it's hard to explain. Somehow, the people who made tennis shoes knew what boys needed and wanted. They put marshmallows in cold springs in the soles, and they wove the rest out of grass bleached and f fired in the wilderness. Somewhere deep in the soft loam of the shoes, the thin, hard sinews of the buck deer were hidden. The people that made the shoes must have watched a lot of winds blow the trees and a lot of rivers going down to the lakes. Whatever it was, it was in the shoes, and it was summer. Douglas tried to get all of this in words. Yes, said Father, but what's wrong with, the, with last year's sneakers? Why can't you dig them out of the closet? Well, he felt sorry for boys who lived in California where they wore shoes all year and never knew what it was to get winter, get winter off your feet. Peel off the iron leather shoes all of, full of snow and rain and run barefoot for a day and then lace on the first new tennis shoes of the season, which was better than barefoot. The magic was always in the new pair of shoes. The magic might die by the 1st of September, but now in late June there was still plenty of magic and shoes like these could jump you over trees and rivers and houses. And if you wanted, they could jump you over fences and sidewalks and dogs. Don't you see, said Douglas, I just can't use last year's pair. For last year's pair were dead inside. They had been fine when he started them out last year. But by the end of summer, every year, you always found out, you always knew, you couldn't really jump over rivers and trees and houses in them, and they were dead. But it was a new year, and he felt that this time, with this new pair of shoes, he could do anything, anything at all. They walked on the on the steps to their house. Save your money, said Dad, in five or six weeks. Summer will be over. Lights out. With Tom, with Tom asleep, Douglas lay watching his feet, far away down there at the end of the bed in the moonlight, free of the heavy iron shoes. The big chunks of winter falling away from them. Reason. I've got to think of reasons for the shoes. Well, as anyone knew, the hills around town were wild with friends, putting cows to riots, 
playing barometer to the atmospheric changes, taking sun, peeling like calendars each day to take more sun. To catch those friends, you must run much faster than foxes or squirrels. As for the town, it seemed with, steamed with enemies, grown irritable with heat. So remembering every winter argument and insult. Find friends, ditch enemies. That was the cream sponge pair of Lightfoot motto. Does the world run too fast? Want to catch up? Want to be alert? Want to stay alert? Lightfoot then, Lightfoot. He held his coin back up and had heard the faint small tinkering, the airy weight of money there. Whatever you want, he thought, you'd got to make your own way. During the night now, let's find the, that path through the forest. Downtown, the store lights went out, one by one. A wind blew in the window. It was like a river going downstream and his feet wanting to go with it. In his dreams, he heard a rabbit running, running, running in the deep, warm grass. Old Mr. Sanderson moved through his shoe store, as a proprietor of a pet shop must move through his shop, where all can are kenneled animals from everywhere in the world, touching each, other, each one briefly along the way. Mr. Sanderson brushed his hands over the shoes in the window, and some of them were like cats to him, and some were like, some were like dogs. He touched each pair with concern, adjusting laces, fixing tongues. Then he stood in the exact center of the carpet and looked around, nodding. There was a sound of growing thunder. One moment, the door to Sanderson's shoe emporium was empty. The next, Douglas Spaulding stood clumsily there, staring down at his leather shoes as if these heavy things could not be pulled out of the cement. The thunder had stopped when his shoes stopped. Now, with painful slowness, slowness, daring to look only at the money in his cupped hand, Douglas moved out of the brick sunlight of Saturday noon. He made careful stacks of nickels, dimes, and quarters on the counter, like someone playing chess and one worried if the next move carried him out of the sun or deep in the shadow. Don't say a word, said Mr. Sanderson. Douglas froze. First, I know just what you want to buy, said Mr. Sanderson. Second, I see you every afternoon at my window. You think I don't see? You're wrong. Third, to give it its full name, you want the Royal Crown Cream Sponge Pair of Light Food Tennis Shoes, like meth menthol on your feet. Fourth, you want credit. No, cried Douglas, breathing hard, as if he'd run all night in his dreams. I got something better than credit to offer, he gasped. Before I tell you, Mr. Sanderson, you got to do me a small favor. Can you remember when was the last time you yourself wore a pair of Lightfoot sneakers, sir? Mr. Sanderson's face darkened. Oh, 10, 20, say 30 years ago? Why? Mr. Sanderson, don't you think you owe it to your, your customers, sir, to at least try the tennis shoes you sell? For just one minute, so you know how they feel. People forget if they don't keep testing things. United Cigarette Store Man smokes cigars, don't he? Candy Store Man samples his own stuff. I should think so. You may have noticed, said the old man, I'm wearing shoes. But not sneakers, sir. How, how are you doing, going to sell sneakers unless you can rave about them? And how are you going to rave about them unless you know them? Mr. Sanderson backed off a little distance from the boy's fever, one hand on his chin. Well... Mr. Sanderson, said Douglas, you sell me something and I'll sell you something just as valuable. It's absolutely, it is absolutely necessary to sell that I put on the, a pair of shoes of the sneakers, boy, said the old man. I sure wish you could, sir. The old man sighed. A minute later, seated panting quietly, he laced the tennis shoes to his long, narrow feet. They looked detached and alien down there next to the dark cuffs of his business suit. Mr. Sanderson stood up. How do they feel? asked the boy. How do they feel? he asked. They feel fine. He started to sit down. Please, Douglas held out his hand. Mr. Sanderson, could you kind of rock back and forth a little? Sponge around, bounce kind of? Can I tell you, while well, I tell you the rest? It's this. 
I give you my money, you give me the shoes. I owe you a dollar. But, Mr. Sanderson, but, soon as I get those shoes on, you know what happens? What? Bang. I deliver your packages, pick up your packages, bring you coffee, burn your trash, run to the post office, telegraph office, library. You'll see 20 of me in and out, in and out, every minute. Feel those shoes, Mr. Sanderson? Feel how fast they take me? All those springs inside. Feel all the running inside. Feel how they kind of grab hold and can't let you, let you alone and don't like you just standing there. Feel how quick I'd be doing the, the things you rather not, uh, you rather not bother with. You stay in the nice cool store while I jump, while I'm jumping around all around town. But it's not me really. It's the shoes. They're going like mad down alleys, cutting corners and back. There they go. Mr. Sanderson stood amazed with the rush of words. When the words got going, the flow carried him. He began to sink di deep in his shoes, to flex his toes, limber his arches, test his ankles. He rocked slowly, secretly, back and forth, in a small breeze from the open door. The tennis shoes silently hushed themselves deep in the carpet, sank as in a ju jungle grass, in loam and resilient clay. He gave one solemn bounce of his heels in the yeast, yeasty dough, in the yielding and welcoming earth. Emotions hurried over his face, as if many lights, colored lights, had been switched on and off. His mouth hung slightly open. Slowly, he gently and rocked, gentled and rocked himself to a halt. And the boy's voice faded, and they stood there looking at each other in a tremendous and natural silence. A few people drifted by on the sidewalk outside in the hot sun. Still, the man and the boy stood there, the boy glowing, the man with revelation in his face. Boy, said the old man at last, in five years, how would you like a job selling shoes in this emporium? Gosh, thanks, Mr. Sanderson, but I don't know what I'm going to be yet. Anything you want to be, son, said the old man, you'll be. No one will ever stop you. The old man walked lightly across the door to the wall of 10,000 boxes, came back with some shoes for the boy, and wrote up a list on some paper while the boy was lacing the shoes on his feet and then standing there waiting. The old man hand held out his list. A dozen things you got to do for me this afternoon. Finish them, and we're even, Stephen, and you're fired. Thanks, Mr. Sanderson, Douglas bounded away. Stop, cried the old man. Douglas pulled up and turned. Mr. Sanderson leaned forward. How do they feel? The boy looked down at his feet, deep in the rivers, in the field of wheat, in the wind that already was rushing him out of town. He looked at the old man, his eyes burning, his mouth moving, but no sound coming out, came out. Antelopes, said the old man, looking at the boy's face to his shoes. Gazelles? The boy thought about it, hesitated, and nodded a quick nod. Almost immediately, he vanished. He just spun about with a whisper and went off. The door stood empty. The sound of the tennis shoes faded in the jungle heat. Mr. Sanderson stood in the sun-blazed door, listening. From a long time ago, when the boy... When he dreamed as a boy, he remembered the sound. Beautiful creatures sleeping under the sky, gone, th gone through the brush, under trees, away, and only the soft echo their running left behind. Antelopes, said Mr. Sanderson. Gazelles. He bent to pick up the boy's abandoned winter shoes, heavy with forgotten rains and long melted snows. Moving out of the blazing sun, walking softly, lightly, slowly, he headed back towards civilization.